Jonathan, I'm so happy that we are here. <laughs> yes, thank you, Verena. Thank you for the invitation. This is super exciting. I always love being in any spaces with you, but especially when we're talking about astrology, I think there's always something really special that unfolds. So thank you for this invitation. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic with you. I'm super excited. And I think that, I mean, it's a double invitation in a way, because this conversation, um, yeah, is published on my YouTube channel. So when you are watching it, welcome to my YouTube channel. And it's at the same time, um, also published on your wonderful podcast, po podcast, yeah. Jonathan. So um, if you listen to the audio version and want to see us, hop onto my YouTube channel. And if you want yes. to have the refined version <laughs> of this conversation, go to Jonathan's podcast because Jonathan is Virgo Ascendant editing the whole conversation and I am not. I'm just Gemini <laughs> Ascendant roughness in your face. So... <laughs> I love it. I love it. I I doubt that I will ever need to um like edit the actual conversation itself, but you know, yeah, I I probably my Virgo ascendant can't help but uh clear up the audio, you know, make little adjustments here and there. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, I would say um maybe would you be so kind to say just one sentence about you and for my yeah. audience and then I can do the same for your audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that invitation. Uh, my name is Jonathan Coe. I am an astrologer. I'm an intuitive. I also work with the Akashic Records. Um, I work with the tarot. I work with a lot of different modalities. Um, and yeah, I, I'm excited to, to do this with you, Verena. Um, I guess another thing that I should mention is I am currently living in Brooklyn, New York, um, and Verena and I met um, in Sabrina Monarch's class. So, yeah. Yeah. How about you, Verena? We met and found each other. I'm so yes. happy that we are together here and that we are together in these learning spaces um, since some time, and it feels like being together since lifetimes for me mm -hmm. <laughs> with you um yeah i'm verena i live in austria and i am an astrologer and yeah i would say my home base in astrology is evolutionary astrology but mm -hmm. i also the more or the longer i am an astrologer the more intuitive i get and mm -hmm. i started to work with the akashic records too so yeah, I would say I'm an astrologer, an intuitive, a channel in a way, a translator in a way of yeah. things that I'm being told to share here. Um, yeah, and I'm also very happy to be here now. And thank you, Jonathan, for letting me speak again in your beautiful podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's always such a pleasure. Um, I should mention too, I would say... You know, I don't really hold these labels with a lot of seriousness, honestly, mm -hmm. but but I think if I have to label it, probably my practice is more grounded in Hellenistic. But that being said, I've also been, you know, essentially educating myself or being in, you know, like evolutionary astrology containers or at least containers that um, are really, you know, rooted in evolutionary astrology practices. Uh, for as long as I've been studying the more Hellenistic stuff too. So yeah, I would say I'm uh, I'm fluid. I'm a fluid astrologer. <laughs> yeah. I would point. say yeah. I'm an, an astrologer in evolution. So Yes, <laughs> I love that, Verena. Also, how mercurial for both of us to be, yeah, to be, um, you know, traveling the liminal spaces between different lineages and traditions. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, totally. And we both said before we start, um, started the recording that it would be um, important for us before we really talk about Pluto and Aquarius, which mm. is our main topic today, that we may yeah. share a little bit with our with both of our audiences 
our approach to transits in general. Mm -hmm. That is something that is very um, important for me because um, I personally consider transits and astrology and planetary movements and so on as a reflection and a mirroring of an of overarching energies and an overarching flow of evolution so planets and transits are not doing something that are, they are not the, the 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 cause of anything but just indicative so they show what is happening inside outside in our psyche on our in our world um and it might be the case that i am using phrases like pluto and aquarius is doing blah 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 and i don't mean it like that it's always so um it's always so a little bit difficult to say pluto and aquarius is reflecting that Mm -mm. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to make that really um, clear at the beginning yeah. that my approach and for that reason, it's never that they are doing something with us that we are helpless individuals, but it's mm -hmm. really a reflection of this overarching energy and we can interact in different forms. And because it's always an archetypal energy, we can um, interact with these energies that are reflected by the cosmos in a more destructive, destructive or constructive way. And therefore, astrology is such a source of wisdom because then we know how we can actually more step into the constructive um, interaction and become aware of maybe some more shadowy qualities. Mm, beautiful beautiful thank you for that yeah i also want to add i i agree with everything you're saying verena and i will also say because of the topic of our conversation today which is pluto and aquarius there will be examples that i'm sharing that are like more mundane example but i do want to be clear that i'm not really a mundane astrologer and so the way i see it is that you know, astrology and maybe transits more particularly is holistic, right? On a personal and collective level, I believe that our external circumstances are really informed by our consciousness and also that our consciousness is informed by external circumstances. And so I think, I think of how the external and the internal playing out as like a loop a little bit. Like I, I think of it as represented uh you know by the ouroboro right like kind of a serpent a serpent eating its own tail rather than monodirectional because i think it's easy when we're hearing more mundane examples to either feel afraid of the things that are going to happen to us right or to feel like the sense of like oh i have to do something from internally to change the external mm -hmm. and i think you know I, I really want to be very clear that like this is not really for me so much a prediction as like a contemplation. I think that's something that I've been emphasizing a lot in my work too, where you know these examples for me are really coming forth as points of contemplation and points of reflection. And I think what's more interesting is in that process of like inquiry or asking a question, and then contemplating on the question and then to see what comes up from the contemplation rather than trying to necessarily predict in a more traditional sense what's going to happen with the transit. Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for saying that. I'm mm -hmm. completely with you. And um, I really like that you are saying that it's more like circular. And for me, it's it's like it's all at the same time here so mm -hmm. it's not really that there is this cause and effect thing so yeah it's the planetary and the planets reflect something that is in me and that reflects something that is outside and i can decide um at on where, where i gonna start to change something so mm -hmm. and the most powerful approach in my point of view is 
to start to change start to change within myself because mm -hmm. I have the most um power over myself than over my environment but the whole conversation here is not to predict anything it's more to um playfully invite you to start asking and to start exploring than to give you any answers i love it very mercurial yes <laughs> so we just made some little uh, notes how we gonna move into this um fruit and aquarius discussion and um i made the um yeah we we both said that we're gonna start with pluto and aquarius as an archetype who will be with us for the next 20 years i think it's huge and then mm -hmm when we have just discussed the highest potential of this um, transit, but also maybe, maybe some more challenging aspects of Pluto and Aquarius, I would really love to hear what you think and feel when we um, focus a little bit more on Pluto and Aquarius and Pluto and Capricorn, the stance of Pluto in 2023 in a square yeah. with the lunar nodes. But yeah. maybe we, we start the big chapter and then zoom in <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i guess to that end what i would add verena just to kind of ground and situate the listeners is i'm not really sure when this is going to come out exactly but essentially uh pluto is has been in capricorn for a long time like a long time 20 some years right and then since pluto will be since 2008 yeah and so Pluto will be um, dipping into Aquarius sometime in March 2023, if I'm not mistaken. I, I can give you the dates. Um, yeah. it's in it, now it's European time, so it can might be the case that there is a little time shift. But Pluto sure. will dip into Aquarius on March 23, 23rd, and then. It will station retrograde and then Pluto will go back into Capricorn on June 11. And then Pluto will again enter Aquarius in January 2024. Mm -hmm. So it will be a short first initial I, I call it initiation or dip mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into Aquarius and I think yeah. in 2024 Pluto will go back again into Capricorn and then go into Aquarius and I think then Pluto will stay in Aquarius for the next 20 years correct correct and and I think that's a really important point to make because these outer planets, right, from the perspective of Earth, move very slowly. And so there is always going to kind of be this um, back and forth action, right? Like we enter or we dip into the vibe of Pluto in Aquarius in March 2023, and then we're going to kind of back off into Capricorn and then forwards again and then backwards again and forwards again. And really, we're going to be solidly entering Pluto in Aquarius with you know, without a point of return, or is that hmm, without any point of return after November 2024? So I think that's kind of worth saying that, you know, even the process of initiating into Pluto and Aquarius, right, is kind of a start and go uh, dance. And I think that already we can feel into uh, the energetics of that a little bit, right? That it is not going to be this, you know, like, jump like i'm currently the image that i have in my in my mind is like you know someone jumping into a pool right it's not going to be a full immersion it's going to be like dipping one toe and then out dipping two toes and then out right yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think i don't know if we, if we want to start with the next year or if we want to start first with the the whole topic but i have this feeling that 2023 with this first dip is really like an initiation. So a seed that is planted 
Yeah. And yeah. then over the next 20 years, when Pluto is traveling through the 29 or 30 degrees from zero to 29 degrees of Aquarius, slowly but surely, we need these 20 time, 20 years, because Plutonic um, transformation and transmutation goes so deep. It's about our mm -hmm. soul from an evolutionary mm -hmm. um, astrology perspective. So it's good that Pluto and that Pluto, that personal transits of Pluto takes so long is very good because we could not. So th this deepness of um, transformation and transmutation needs time. And I think it is really important now we are here in December 2022 and we are looking we are looking into a timeline before us um, over the next 20 years. And it feels for me really crazy because since I am learning astrology, Pluto is in Capricorn. Pluto is in Capricorn since 2008. So, mm -hmm. and for me, it's really, it feels huge that Pluto is entering Aquarius. And I feel that um, on an individual and on a collective level, we must give ourselves time to accumulate and to that this archetypal energies can unfold. And mm -hmm. I mean, I personally think that we will feel it in March mm -hmm. in some way, because when Pluto entered Capricorn in 2008, it was actually on in the world very you noticed it and yeah. so i'm actually pretty sure that we will notice something in our personal life or in the collective mm. but i think that it is important to also um know that the first the the zero degree and the last degrees. I think the last degrees of a sign and the first degrees are always so potent. Mm -hmm. And that there is maybe a certain intensity that then might... I mean, we have we have 20, 20 years to learn our Pluto and Aquarius lessons. In a way. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're already providing a really beautiful segue into thinking about... Pluto in general, Verena, and then also thinking about Aquarius in general. Um, so yeah, shall we go into that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, you know, something that I will mention with regards to the Plutonic and, you know, I, I would love to hear your thoughts about this, but I, I do feel like when we're thinking about the outer planets, because in traditional astrology, we don't really have a lot of uh, data, we don't have a lot of anecdotes and mythology around it. I think it's really important to both rely on modern astrologers' work as well as also um, pay attention to kind of like our own personal gnosis. Like to me, working with the outer planets, it feels really, really important to use our um, ability to commune directly, to attune directly with the planets and to kind of feel into what does this planet feel like, right? Because we don't always have as much um, history behind it that maybe, you know, like for example, comparing Pluto to like Jupiter or to Saturn, right? Is a very different experience. Um, yeah, it's a very different experience to, to learn about Pluto, Neptune and Uranus because, um yeah, we don't have the wisdom, the scholarship of um, astrologers prior to the discovery of these planets, right? Um, and so, we cannot see them. What was that? We cannot see them. Yes, exactly. We cannot see them. Although, you know, I've heard that apparently you can see Uranus during certain moments of Uranus's uh, cycle you can actually see uranus in the sky but yeah you're right absolutely um there is something i think in the symbology of like not being able to see them where i and also at the same time i think outer planet experience is very pervasive and it's really kind of felt right so 
um for me when i when i began tuning into like the energy of pluto um the first thing that came up for me in my body was like this experience of kind of like emptying out you mm-hmm. know, of kind of like burning out which is you know in contrast to for example when i think about jupiter and i felt into the energy of jupiter i felt an energy of filling up right with saturn i feel this energy of like calcification of like kind of grounding down and like really committing to a particular form for pluto i really the image that is coming up for me is almost like you know almost this buddhist idea of like emptying yourself out of prior um perspectives of knowledge right it's like if you think you knew the plutonic journey is going to show you all the places that you didn't know before right Mm -hmm. how about you verena wow jonathan i i just i just love this um how you are feeling the planets because it resonates so much with my approach to really get Mm -hmm. in a felt experience with astrology in general and for me personally um now that you open this topic so beautifully with this feeling that we have with Pluto for me personally I completely agree with you for me Pluto is purging for me Pluto is mm. this um this this image of I have to go very deep and dig in the dirt dirt to really um um yeah I I have the I have the image now of soil of really dark soil and you have to dig deep you have to uh, maybe um, take out stuff so that it gets healthy again and that beautiful flowers can grow there so with Pluto I ha- or this idea of um, sometimes when I was a child I sometimes had this high fevers and I was sweating <laughs> sweating like hell and after that you felt like clear and clean in a way. And I think with Pluto, we have these cons. This Pluto is for me the symbol of this constant um, death and rebirth process mm. that we always in our life and in nature and that we can see everywhere this constant um idea of something in us around us with us has to die so that something new can be born and because of that there is a cyclical evolution of death and rebirth death and rebirth the the um the, the chrysalis and the, the butterfly and the caterpillar and for me it is very it feels in a way very, I feel it very deep in my body. Mm-hmm. And it totally makes sense for me that um, evolutionary astrology, Jeffrey Wolf Green, um, connects the root chakra with Pluto. So mm-hmm. I have this feeling of you have to go deep to clear yourself, to purge, and to even find your light. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah this idea of like going deep in order to purge and to find light i think is really powerful because um i also think about the idea of the underworld with pluto right a lot of mythology of pluto of hades is related to the underworld and so you know one feature i think that's fascinating to contemplate about the underworld is this idea of anonymity how you know all the things that we've accrued in the above world status um wealth social standing is no longer helpful to us in the underworld sometimes you know often when we see depictions of the underworld they're just kind of we we see depictions of bodies right of just like bodies with this immutable force kind of moving in in certain directions rather than individuals you know and and i think also when I think about Pluto, I think about the idea of loss. And, you know, with regards to transformation, I think it's also worth noting that 
the kind of plutonic transformation is one that's um oh it's kind of like a um a one track process right it's like you know it's immutable and it's irreversible right we can kind of think about this maybe grounding it in the mythology of like orpheus and eurydice right that this idea of like you have lost your lover to the underworld and even if you try to get this person back you're either gonna fail or you're gonna do something stupid to like basically mess it up right or persephone and demeter that once persephone was either abducted or had gone into the underworld the the initial union that persephone had with demeter is no longer available right um also i think in the plutonic you know you can even think about the the archetype of persephone herself you know that once persephone went down into the underworld there is now this divide of like persephone the daughter in the above world versus persephone the queen of the underworld right so i think with plutonic themes there is uh you know to kind of go back to what you were saying about how plutonic transformation kind of happens over time and happens slowly I would also add that like with the slowness of that transformation, there's also a totality of the transformation, right? Yeah. It changed you completely. And there's the sense that like, you can't really go back to wherever you came from. Mm -hmm. I love that Jonathan. And I would even add something first, Persephone, she, and it's, we all had these experiences that we had, that we had to go to the in the underworld and afterwards we are no longer the person that we are before so mm -hmm. persephone is no longer core so before she goes into the underworld her name is core and that even means girl that, that is no real name and then she goes into the underworld and then she gets her name yes. and then she becomes persephone and even though she might go back she goes back to her mother She's now not the Kura that she was before. And I think that I'm not 100% sure, but I think that Jeffrey Wolf Green says that Pluto is not only transformation, but transmutation. And the difference mm -hmm. is when you transform, you just change the form. But transmutation means that like the... Um, like the caterpillar and the chrysalis, that your complete cell material, everything that you are, get completely meshed, becomes no nothing and something completely new. It's re reborn. And I think mm -hmm. that is so much this plutonic way of transformation or even transmutation, where you really transmute into a new cell. And mm -hmm. I think that happens every day in a way, that happens over time, that happens over life cycles. Pluto as our soul that comes, that has many incarnations in a way. Pluto as the desire to reincarnate, mm -hmm. to in a way expand and mm -hmm. be rebirthed again and again um, to gain quote unquote power. But for me, it's more to gain more wisdom in a way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that this image of the underworld is very important with Pluto. And um, I think it's even, it's part of life. So it's part of the world to have an underworld and yeah. part, it's nothing that we have to be afraid of, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's also reminding me, Verena, of, um, I, I would, would like to caution um, listeners too, around this idea of too quickly um, merging planetary forces with just one mythology right because even when we think about pluto as connected to the underworld 
the overlap is not just with Hades and Persephone, which is one version of the story of the underworld, but also maybe with Dionysus or even with like Jesus, right? Because Dionysus and Jesus also had connections to the underworld and Dionysus is essentially this uh, deity of excess, right? Of, um, mm -hmm. of fermentation too, you know? So there's a sense of like creating wine or creating... Uh, meat or creating beer through fermentation is something that is also like an underworld process, right? I think what you were saying about transmutation is deeply connected to alchemy. And um, you can also think about this in terms of like the Jesus mythology of like going down into the underworld for three days and then emerging victorious, right? There is, I think, um, all of these different relationships that we can have with the underworld that is not just encapsulated by one myth and one myth alone. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we have even in within the Venus cycle, the Nana story with the death yeah. of Nana and the rebirth. And I think right. that one thing is very important and maybe uh, we can go afterwards um, to Pluto in Aquarius, what that means. Absolutely, yes. I think that one important um, thing is that we die to be rebirthed mm. Mm. so death as not we live and then we die but we die so that something new can be birth i think yeah. that is really because that that brings more I, I think we as human beings that have just a very limited capacity to understand life are always um, very have this limited view often that we think okay we live and then we die and then everything is dark and everything we are at the end and that feels very scary but I think Pluto really invites us to see the life cycles from the perspective of our soul mm -hmm. and because of that even these underworld journeys that we might have not not always but which may become with pluto are just part of a larger cycle mm, and I love that. are actually serving our life journey yeah i really love that yeah yeah i think it's interesting because sometimes when you read modern astrologers they like to talk about pluto as um this idea of where we fall in the scale or the spectrum of empowerment and disempowerment. And I think it's interesting to bring in what you just said, Verena, because I think it's very empowering to start interacting with death, both um, literal and metaphorical, as a portal, right? Death as um, a tool that we can um, use in order to um transmute or to transform or to have the rebirth experience like what does it look like to um know that death is intimately connected to life right yeah. i also once had this meditation uh, also with pluto where what i heard was that living is dying and mm -hmm. i think there's kind of something very profound around that where you know if you think of once the human life at least you know life as we understand it as this finite um you know i was born and then i died at the age of 86 or whatever right age that you ended up dying if you look at your life as like this ruler the more you live the closer you get to death you know and so, and so yeah i know <laughs> so saturnian and i can kind of feel you know capricorn aquarius starting to kind of come in here but mm -hmm. yeah this idea of really meditating you know meditating on life as connected intimately with death and death intimately connected with life that they are really part of a cycle rather than um as you said the ending yeah, yeah. i love that and I also, I, I, I see Pluto very much connected to these topics around power too, and dis mm -hmm. these, this disempowerment and power. And I, 
I think I, I don't want to go too deep into that because I think we should um, focus now on Pluto and Aquarius, but just yeah. to mention that, that this power and disempowerment and self-empowerment, I think Pluto can teach us or Pluto reflects that there are lessons for us as human beings and as souls that incarnated on planet Earth to learn around the difference between stepping into this power that is really self-empowerment that comes from the heart and wants to empower others too and mm -hmm. giving away our power or overpower others so there is definitely something to to learn with Pluto but I think that even and I think that it is a gateway to Pluto and Aquarius even when we feel in a way disempowered sometimes I have the feeling and I hope that it is okay that I'm saying that I sometimes have the feeling sometimes we must feel disempowered so that we have the inch to step into our power mm -hmm. and to reclaim our power yeah and that can happen over over big cycles of in our life um even i i'm aware of past lives where i was powerlessness mm -hmm. and i'm aware of past lives where i was um the persecutor oppressor yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so i think that it's all about really reclaiming this very um, soul-based power in a good way. And mm. yeah, I'm, I'm really um, excited now with Pluto entering Aquarius because I, Jonathan, I asked myself, because I'm always very much my 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 um, approach to astrology and to transit is really i'm 100 percent sure that everything happens for our soul's evolution for our the evolution of every individual and the collective i'm really um i feel that and when i tap into my akashic records i feel that this universe is friendly it's very Aquarian approach, by the way, to say that it is friendly, that we live in a friendly world, even though it mm -hmm. might look different. And I am very sure when I when I receive the messages from my spirit guides, from my Akashic Records guides, that not many, many, many beings in this universe are trying to support planet Earth that we can make it here. You know, yeah. and yeah. I love that. I asked myself, what would be the highest potential of Pluto and Aquarius? Mm. And I, 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 I did a note about that just before we met, and I think I will read it. And I would be super interesting interested in what you think and what you feel. So sure. I have written down the highest potential with Pluto and Aquarius is that we rebirth ourselves as the authentic authentic soul that we are before we experienced any limiting conditions conditionings the highest potential of pluto and aquarius is that everyone comes back to their natural soul frequency lives according to their soul's essence and therefore serves the, co the collective with their individual gifts the highest potential is that we rebirth ourselves and the world and liberate from repressive and distorted systems. But to rebirth ourselves and the world means that something must die. Mm, I love that. I love that. That actually reminds me, Verena, of something you said to me recently, which I have just been holding near and dear to my heart, which is this idea that harmony is really achieved when everyone is playing their part and everyone is emanating the frequency that they're supposed to based on their soul template i think that's really beautiful and as a musician you know i always use this example that you don't ever want to listen to an orchestra where everybody's playing the same note or everybody <laughs> All the instruments have the same timbre because boring. it's actually just kind of awful and not just boring. I would say it's it's kind of an assault on the senses, right? That beauty really comes through when we allow this level of diversity. But maybe I am uh, 
encroaching the the realm of Libra a little bit here. But I really love what you were saying about rebirthing ourselves as your authentic version. And I think what is really interesting to think about with Pluto in Aquarius is perhaps, you know, what are some of the possible ways um, on a more micro level that that can happen? You know, so what I really mean by that is, you know, I will kind of bring in my contemplation here around the idea of, you know, when I think about the about Aquarius, right? Aquarius is a fixed air sign. And it's interesting because the sign that came before Aquarius is Capricorn, as we've discussed. And in traditional astrology, both Capricorn and Aquarius are ruled by Saturn. So you kind of feel this uh, level of resonance. There is something about... Uh, Capricorn and Aquarius that are connected to one another, you know, in some ways, maybe more from like an, you know, evolutionary astrology perspective or modern astrology perspective that thinks about the modern rulership of Aquarius um, as Uranus, you know, and then the whole Saturn unification doesn't really work anymore. We can also kind of think about Capricorn and Saturn or Capricorn and Aquarius as the two signs that are opposite the, the luminaries, right? So even if we don't use traditional rulership, we can kind of think about how, you know, Capricorn and Aquarius are both the signs that are furthest away, in a way, from the luminaries, you know? And I it, it makes me think about this idea of structure, you know? And um, again, structure is a word that we use for Capricorn, but for Aquarius, I think about more of the airy structures, right? The unspoken social rules rather than the codified laws, right? The air element, you know, is is interesting because it always makes me think about how we are breathing oxygen and we don't quite understand the quality of the air that we consistently breathe, right, on a daily basis until we get out of that place. You know, recently I um, had the chance of traveling to see my family again, halfway across the world for the first time since the pandemic. And it is wild, Verena, to experience how being in a different culture can make the process of repatriating or like coming back to like where I'm currently living as being this really jarring experience. You know, so you're suddenly hyper aware of people's facial expressions, people's tone of voice, you know, what is considered rude and not considered rude, being so different than other places, right? So culture is so ingrained in us. And it's not, you know, even though we don't have laws around culture, those social laws and these social interactions are so prevalent. And in some sense, they both create a container and they can also serve as our imprisonment, right? Mm -hmm. I would like to pause there and kind of hear, you know, if you have anything to add to that or respond to that. Mm -hmm. I love what you said, Jonathan. And I think it's so, it's very um, good. And I really felt drawn to talk with you about roots and Aquarius because I know that you are, have roots in Hellenistic astrology as well. So where you have this rulership, because for me, um, because I'm not um, so much into Hellenistic astrology. For me, um, the ruler is Uranus. And mm -hmm. I I have, but but I I can understand the Hellenistic. So I'm not close to that. I, I understand the Hellenistic perspective and these two sides of Saturn, the yin and the yang side of Saturn and the air and the um, earth. But for me, it feels very much like this in Capricorn and I think we felt that so strongly um we really it's about our conditionings and because we live in a hierarchical system in centuries we um connect Capricorn often with patriarchal hierarchical system so but that's not original Capricorn maybe we can talk about that later when we talk about the upcoming year but I think we become um yeah it's Capricorn is about these conditionings that we 
take over from our surrounding over lifetimes from our parents from society and so on and then an Aquarius and I think that's so interesting an Aquarius in Aquarius with Uranus Aquarius air so we become objective we can step away and look at ourselves, look at our life, look at our conditioning, and therefore we can liberate ourselves. So okay. it's really about this, a little bit, a little, there is some coolness around Aquarius because of this objectivity and of this intellectual uh, view that allows us to liberate and to come back to something that is more natural to our soul. And mm. I, I, I mean, I have in my natal chart Saturn in a balsamic conjunction to Uranus. So I really have it in my chart, this Saturn-Uranus um, meeting <laughs> or coming together. And I think it's not, even Aquarius, I totally see that like you. It's not about having no structures. I think it's about having authentic, living according to our authentic ways. And I think as a soul that incarnated on planet Earth in a body, we are, it, we cannot have no structures. So our body is a structure. Our body is a vessel. Um, we live here in a time-space continuum. And in Aquarius, we, um, we experience ourselves as beings that can zoom out, that can leave time and space. And I think here is such a, the, it's a gift and at the same time, the disease in a way. So it's it's the, the, the beautiful gift of Aquarius. And I see that so much connected with Pluto and Aquarius too, that we maybe on a very personal level experience in the next, in the upcoming years that we say, okay, I played these rules. I played these roles, I followed these rules, I had these mm. structures in my life, I thought I have to be this or that, and I become more and more aware that my soul's authentic, um, yeah, my, my soul's authenticity, and what I came here for, when I don't listen to voices outside or internalized voices, um, mm. I feel that more and more and I can see it because I step away from um, the, the idea that I have to fulfill expectations of society, of external authority figures. Mm -hmm. And I think on an individual level, Pluto and Aquarius can have this high, high, high potential that we allow ourselves more and more to come back to our soul's isness to the natural essence of our soul. And therefore, from the individual on, we can create new structures, quote unquote, within new networks. I think um, for me, the Aquarius structures is more the network um, mm. structure um, so that we allow ourselves and therefore others too, to become more and more our unique essence and mm. allow ourselves to change because that is really important i think that because when we when we say okay now i know who i am i'm not any longer this or that now i know who i am we 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 have to be we have to be very careful that we don't even crystallize this um being that we feel at this moment so that we yes. allow ourselves to change on and on and i think with pluto and aquarius it's really about okay what has to die the this part of me that thinks it has to follow certain rules that are unnatural for me that part of me has to die so that i can um, come back to my authentic soul's isness and allow myself to live more and more accordingly to that and therefore do what I'm here for and serve the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that Verena I it makes me think about I wasn't really gonna gonna talk about this but what you were saying reminds me of like the sequence between Capricorn and then Aquarius and then Pisces, right? Because there was a piece there that you mentioned around crystallizing. And I think this is 
really important to remember for the Aquarian part of us, right? That yes, once we find a new structure that we feel reflects who we are in this moment, there can be a tendency to then want to crystallize again until we learn the Piscean lesson, right? And I do think this is fascinating because um, I'm a Pisces sun and I am surrounded by Aquarius suns in my life. Like um, mm -hmm. my partner is an Aquarius sun. I have a lot of Aquarius sun friends. And I always like to lovingly and compassionately joke with them about how Aquarius always likes to think about how... Um, they, they, they Aquarius likes to consider themselves to be really avant-garde and to be really out there and to be really revolutionary. And I think there's some truth to that. But um, I think the real revolutionary is Pisces, actually, because <laughs> the Pisces in us already is kind of like moving from that place of like the inner child and the inner elder at the same time. The Pisces part of us is walking in a dream. And within that dream, there are no rules. You know, yeah. the Pisces parts of us presupposes that there are already no rules, whereas I think the Aquarius part of us is breaking away from that rule, right? I think if you think about the modern rulership of uh, Aquarius as being ruled by Uranus, something that um, the astrologer Rick Tarnas had pointed out in his book Cosmos and Psyche is that uh, Uranus mythology or Uranus as a planet mm -hmm. is much more tied to the mythology of Prometheus yes. than Uranus, right? Yes. And in the mythology of the Prome of Prometheus, there is this push and pull between the existing power structure and the emergent power structure. And I think what is really important to remember as we are moving into this Aquarian process is that, you know, the answer is that there are no rules, right? The answer is Pisces, ultimately. Like, ultimately, the Aquarian part of us really wants to kind of move into the Piscean realm of already living the dream, already living the ideal. And it's still kind of in this process of navigating what does it mean to move from the Capricornian place of structure and rigidity into the Piscean place of, you know, realizing that you make the structure right you create the rules and if you are aware that you um, have this divinity within you that can uh, dictate the rules you can change the rules at any time you know and that you don't have to be beholden to any rules including the ones you create for yourself yeah and these are the most strict rules that we create mm -hmm. for ourselves exactly i actually love what you say and i would love to reflect something that came up for me um and interesting side note saturn will move into pisces when pluto will move into aquarius so yes as <laughs> a little side note so we have exactly these three archetypes the saturn capricorn archetype the Aquarius archetype and the Pisces archetype. We all yes. will um, feel that, live that in the next mm -hmm. few years. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to say is that as you were talking about Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces, for me, it feels very much like, and even when we see it in the natural zodiac, when we start with Aries, so these are the last three signs. Mm -hmm. um so we wrap the cycle up in a way and i have the feeling that in aquarius or i can feel that in a way that there is this um a little bit of a split because in aquarius we experience ourselves as a frequency a soul frequency we can zoom out mm -hmm. with our with our higher consciousness It's so much about our higher self, our high, higher consciousness. I even feel the Akashic records very much as an Uranian, Aquarian energy. So really we have this capacity as human beings or who's, as souls who incarnated on Earth to zoom out, to leave our body, to leave time and space, to go into the Akashic fields, to go into outer space with our higher, higher mind. And Aquarius is, as my teacher Ari um, Murti Wolf always says, is um, the divine intelligence of the cosmos. Mm. 
That's Aquarius. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think in Aquarius, we must see or we should not forget that we are still human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something, um, there is a certain split within the Aquarius archetype because this idea that we are more than our body and than our Saturnian Capricornian matter and reality is it starts in Pi it starts in Aquarius and then in Pisces we understand that even matter is part of the all that is that mm -hmm. everything is everything so that yeah. everything is divine and everything is um light mm -hmm. but i think in aquarius we have this clash between and maybe i say that because at the moment we still have uranus in taurus so we have this um yeah now i i got all of these insights and i zoomed out and i have been in the akashic fields and how can i bring it to earth yeah and i think that will be the challenge um especially on a collective level or maybe too uh, as an uh, on an individual level because i think that all of these um wisdoms that we gain all of these liberation and all of this freedom of our mind um our soul decided to incarnate on planet earth mm -hmm. so it's part of our pluto and aquarius experience i think to um bring that power back to earth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so what you're saying makes me think about um the experience that i think we've been having in the past year specifically around resurgence of more animistic beliefs Verena, or like animist spirituality because i do think that it's also very much a foreshadowing to this Pluto in Aquarius energy. And in fact, you can even think about it, you know, I, I love that you were bringing up this idea of the Pluto Aquarius transit in March 2023 will coincide with Saturn entering into Pisces. So I think we can kind of see that there is at this moment, at least there is this relationship where Saturn is kind of teaching Pluto almost kind of like, hey, this is what's going to come up because the Aquarius energy is already present with, uh, with Saturn in the past year, you know. And I think I I, I like to correlate this with the idea of animus spirituality because I think, um, animus spirituality really helps us understand that there is spirit to everything, including that which we, in the modern uh, lexicon of our times consider as inanimate objects like for example the internet right we like to think that the internet is this like dead thing when in reality there's also a spirit to the internet right there's also soul to the internet and how we work with this spirit of the internet is actually much more up to us than we like to think it is so something i want to point out just kind of as an example that came up for me when I'm thinking about Pluto and Aquarius is, you know, our internet etiquette, right? Like how we treat each other uh, when we when we interact through the internet, you know, how we uh, comment on each other's um, thoughts and ideas and presence, right? Uh, a few years ago, this idea of being canceled on the internet was really present. And I think it's really fascinating to see as Saturn and third Aquarius, how there's a lot of um, conversation towards the opposite direction, right? Towards the idea of like, hey, remember when you are canceling someone on the internet for something that they wrote 15 years ago, the person you're canceling is a human. Remember mm -hmm. the humanity yeah. behind this person, right? And then also this idea of selection, I think is really important to talk about because I notice a lot of conversations around uh, the algorithm and how, you know, oh, I hate being on social media because the algorithm shows me what I need to see. And I feel 
really um, with compassion, I want to point out that what you see via the algorithm is a reflection of your behavior, you know? <laughs> and so I think these are very Aquarian themes that are that are coming up. And I think with Pluto entering Aquarius, I when I felt into it, the energy is around really remembering our agency, you know, and our participation uh, with regards to uh, what we ended up consuming, right? And similarly, also, I think, um, this idea of the avatar, you know, recently, while we're recording this, there's a new trend of um, inputting your personal photo into an app called, I believe, Lensa is probably the most popular. And then it will spit back out this um, artificial intelligence generated art, right, to kind of give you your avatar. And I think this idea of the avatar, you know, this idea of how we present ourselves to the world it's really interesting to kind of track the energetics of Pluto and Aquarius through the avatar, because I think we are in a moment now as a collective where the divide is starting to be normalized, right? The divide of ourselves as, you know, human beings, like who have feet, who are rooted to wherever we are currently situated on earth is separate than who we are on the internet and that there's no shame around this, right? That in fact, you know, this illusion that social media has to represent quote unquote reality is starting to shatter as we become, you know, more practiced in the game of Leo and Aquarius, right? Of presenting ourselves publicly through our teeny tiny little devices, right? We start to realize that this um, persona of who we are behind closed doors when nobody else is watching, who we are when we're with our closest friends, and who we are when we are seen in the public square is tale that's as old as time, right? Like this idea of the avatar is not new. <laughs> we like to think it's new, but in fact, it's only new because we are working with this idea or the, this concept of the avatar in a new uh channel in a new format right the instagram may be a new app but this idea of the divide that we create between ourselves behind closed doors and in public squares is really ancient you know and in fact maybe there is potential for collaboration between emergent technology and who we are and who we've always been as humans um, and in the process of that collaboration, in that pr process of the marriage of our analog self and our digital self, maybe there's something uh, new that will emerge, right? There's a new way of being. And hopefully, as you said, Verena, there is um, more of an awareness of what is our natural soul frequency. Yeah. Wow, that was amazing, Jonathan. And I want to add that I think you brought up um, with the avatar, the Leo polarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we start a new Venus cycle in Leo in 2023, when Pluto will have these back and forth into Aquarius. Venus will start her new cycle, which is um, 18 months this, I think, July or August in Leo. So mm -hmm. I think Venus and Leo is so much connected to our heart mm. and really to um, Leo is fire. It's our heart. It's, it is our animal body too. Mm -hmm. So I think that it can help us to ground more into our heart's frequency um, so that we don't zoom out too much. Mm -hmm. And what you said about these, all of these things with the internet and our avatar and social, social um, uh, these algorithms and so on. Jonathan, and I don't want, I really don't want to scare anybody, but I have the feeling that when Pluto travels through Aquarius, at the moment how I feel it, 
there are certain um, certain figures or groups who have the quote unquote power mm-hmm. within social networks, all of these apps, who creates the algorithms and so on. And when Pluto moves into Aquarius, I I don't think that the whole internet will collapse or something like that. Never. But I think that we will have completely, there will be happen something. And I think that it comes to a more a decentralization. And I can even, um, I can, yeah, I, what I can imagine is that many, many people say no because they go too far. These mm-hmm. powerful people within these social networks go too far so that you are shadow banned, et cetera, and so on, that it it went so, gets so intense that many, 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 many people say, okay, no, I don't want that. I create new ways to socially interact and maybe have alternative concepts, how we can connect around the world via networks without being so dependent on these very, I mean, the internet is very, it's a very um, old, how it is structured is very old. It feels very Mm -hmm. Californian for me. It feels very um, the old way, hierarchical. Um, patriarchal, not Capricornian, because the original Capricorn is not patri- patriarchal, but it feels patriarchal. It feels very, there are certain parties who have the power and they dictate what you, how the algorithm is, how much you have to pay for an advert post. And when you don't pay as a, a the owner of a business account, then nobody will see your post and so on. And I think mm-hmm. there is something there, maybe there will be some change around that. Maybe there will come back the power to the individual Mm -hmm. and to um, decentralize this whole thing so that that it really serves its original, um, yeah, I mean, the original idea is that we can connect, that we can share, Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. it does not matter in which area and in which time zone. So we are out of time and space in a way within these social networks with Zoom, with Instagram, with Facebook and and so on. And we can connect, we can share. We can share our gifts with the world in a way. And we are already doing it. Yeah, yeah. But I think the ways or how it is structured, there can be something that can can be better and that can be um, developed mm-hmm. and evolved. Mm-hmm. I agree. I also see that perhaps a similar pattern will also emerge in the IRL world. You know, there is uh, the URL, which we've kind of talked about at great lengths, but I think also in real life, there may be more attempts um, around people organizing and trying to create their own social reality whether that's you know uh i don't know like creating a commune you know or maybe even creating a new country i think that may be a a theme that we kind of see throughout this period and again as you mentioned verena this is a very long transit so there's a lot of space for experimentation and for like new ways of behaving to emerge and you know something i will say that i think is interesting from um, one of my teachers, Leah Garza, you know, this was, and, and this is something that she communicated or she shared about when uh, the abortion laws, Roe v. Wade, was overturned in the U.S. You know, it was, just to paraphrase it, um, it was this question of, like, why do we let governments determine what we do to our bodies? You know, mm-hmm. where is the inherent disempowerment that we feel, right? The inability that we feel to govern ourselves and our own body to be able to cede that authority to a, a government, you know, or the legislatures, right? Um, I think Pluto in Aquarius can really show us where we feel unconsciously not equipped within our own personal and relational authority autonomy to handle things that should actually be governed by ourselves as 
as individuals, you know? I have a really silly example around this, which is, you know, nobody ever, or as far as I'm aware, there are no laws in the United States around farting, right? And I'm talking about the release of like bodily gas. And that's because, you know, social norms and rules around farting is so prevalent, right? So it's very clear to us, like, where is it appropriate to fart and where is it not appropriate to fart, right? <laughs> and there are all of these unwritten social norms around it that are strong enough so that we don't feel the need to codify certain laws in order to understand what's responsible and not responsible. And I think this theme, I don't mean that necessarily there's going to be an overhaul of how the laws work necessarily. I mean, maybe, maybe no, right? But I do think these questions are going to be really present for a lot of us. And also this idea of like, you know, what is, what are human rights? You know, what does it mean to be human, right? What are rights? You know, are we machines? <laughs> I think like these questions are really going to come up and we're going to really have to grapple with them. We're going to have to play with them in a way that we have been playing with questions around authority and existing structures when Pluto was in Capricorn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Completely, Jonathan. And I... I also want to mention that I think when we do really our Capricorn work in a good way, so when we um, step into our self-authority and we learn to act self-responsible and when we learn to act in integrity, we don't need authority, uh, authorities outside who say what we have to do. So it's really when, when we actually do our Capricorn job in a good way, we can be free in Aquarius because then we don't have we don't need um, restrictive rules or people who say what we have to do because we are self responsible, we are matured, and then we can. So Capricorn is really the preparation for Aquarius, and I think mm -hmm. that we can just have freedom on a on a bigger scale when every yeah. soul is doing their inner work and is acting self-responsible and responsible and in alignment with integrity because i mean we had the last time pluto was in aquarius was during the french revolution so they mm -hmm. wanted freedom but the people have not been the, the inner the inner evolution was not um they could not, they have not yet learned to behave responsible when there are no um, governments and kings and queens that tell them what to do or what not to do, like a little child. So I really mm -hmm. hope that we are now, 250 years later, um, on an individual and on a collective level, and we have 20 years time for that, matured enough so that we can actually slowly but surely have more freedom and more levels of freedom and less restrictive rules um, mm -hmm. on an individual and on a collective level, because I think that is the overarching topic that I feel so much that we come from centuries really centuries and lifetimes of systems that were that have been distorted that have been um, oppressive in a way mm -hmm. and that we are and i think that our generation who's living now who's listening to the podcast and watching this video i am not sure if we in this lifetime um will really um live in this new world quote unquote but we are we have incarnated because our soul wants to co-create it and we are in this in-between phase where and i feel that so strongly emphasized now in the upcoming year it's really like it's focusing this this topic is focusing in the next year because we have pluto and capricorn the old systems we know what is no longer working the tower is falling down it's broken but mm -hmm. the new is not yet to come so with pluto and aquarius dipping into aquarius in 2023 there are maybe first vision seeds 
on a individual and on a collective level what might be the new way what might be um, a more authentic and free way to live and to work and to live together and to build communities yeah. and to build relationships but it's not yet here so it's really about this huge 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 shift which will go over decades on a collective level i think on an individual level it is really it can be so much quicker where we yeah let go of what is no longer working and find these new visions and mm -hmm. what might be and how that might unfold i don't know i'm really excited about that i feel yeah. very strongly me personally as verena i feel very strongly that i am in this destruct destructive deconditioning process and that there yeah. is something there wants to come something um mm -hmm. that feels more expansive more free more natural and i think that this is the overarching theme of the next year and the years to come. Yeah, I stop here. <laughs> I love that. I also think that, you know, it's it's a good time as we are mm, shifting out of Pluto and Capricorn. And as we are, as we mentioned earlier, like dipping in and out of Pluto and Aquarius to... To really, I think, center into um, what I feel is one of the most helpful or most um, radiant manifestation of the Capricorn energy, which is the idea of like studying structures and studying history in order to like uncover the heart of history. Because I think there's one way of approaching the, the Capricornian where we can... Um, you know, be on a very mental level, analyzing all the ways that the structure has gone wrong. But I think part of, you know, this liminal space we're in, transitioning from Capricorn to Aquarius, also has a lot to do with, you know, trying to recover what is at the heart of the creation of those structures in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then not maybe feeling pressure to recreate it, but to understand that in order to truly innovate, right, you must understand the rules. You must understand what came before it. I do think that this is very important. And I think that it's it's powerful to not just leave structures, but to understand while leaving, what was it about the energetics of that structure that have become cancerous right and to be really aware not to replicate it when you create a new structure because it's easy yeah. for us in this human form with our logical mind to think that okay i'm just going to create a new structure and then it's going to be problem is completely solved right like i don't have to worry about it anymore but the reality is i think you know bringing in this idea maybe again of how pisces can teach aquarius is that the energetics is actually what always informs the structure. And even if you have the most perfect structure without being attuned to the energetics, it's kind of a dangerous endeavor, you know, to to think that structures can can save you. Mm -hmm. I like that. And I like that Pisces has this natural sextile to Capricorn. Yes. And I have this feeling of, and that is always what I preach when I talk about Capricorn and the original Capricorn, that Capricorn is this very flexible, loving structure that mm -hmm. actually um, grows with you mm -hmm. and that can adapt and that can give your soul and your Pisces um, flow a little grounding in a loving way. And when you were talking about structures and that it is might be important to study the the reason for structures or even what went wrong and so that we don't recreate it the image i i i had the image of um plants actually that are structures mm -hmm. so like leaves natural structures what is a natural structure 
everywhere where we are going in nature are structures. Everything in nature is structured. But these structures are part of a living system. Mm -hmm. And they grow and they unfold. Yeah. So how can we, and this is an open question, how can we on an individual level, and I ask that myself too in my life, how can I, how can you, how can we create structures that are natural, that grow with us, mm -hmm. that allow us to unfold, that are giving us a certain kind of um feeling of being hold without being restricted mm -hmm. and i think that is in a way very aquarian and very pluto and aquarius that we say okay everything must die that is not um in alignment with our soul's essence with the intelligence of the cosmos and how can we recreate our world in a way that um yeah every soul can live according to their nature and to their mm -hmm. natural essence mm -hmm. beautifully said yeah I yeah like that. jonathan i think you have to wrap it up it up slowly but surely yeah are there any other points that you would like to make or something that you kind of would love to leave the listeners with yes one thing is very important i think really important um all of these changes that we are in and i i think i have the feeling and what i'm being told 2022 and the last years were just the preparation so it's when Pluto moves into Aquarius, I think there will be many, many, many shifts. And what I'm being told by my guides is that it becomes increasingly important, increasingly important to learn to regulate our nervous system. Mm. Because yeah. our human body is not used to these changes and everything, even though our higher self and even though our mind and our um, consciousness says, okay, mm -hmm. yes, I want this change or I want to let go of this or that or I want to try this new way of living. Our animal body feels that everything that is new is dangerous and therefore we are in a trauma reaction and when we are in a panic and trauma reaction and i think many of us and i think that is a huge topic of pluto and aquarius too that maybe many of us that is something that i really recognize i recognize now that i am since i'm alive acting many often i'm many often in a state of panic and stress from past lives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that can be a huge point of where healing can come up. Because when I look in our world and in our society, I have the feeling that here are many, many people who are acting um, from a state of trauma and panic that they have from their past and their past lives. And that it is of huge importance that we become aware of that and that we learn to really um, work with our body, calm down our nervous system, because just when we are acting from a place of peace, we can really um, make decisions that are in alignment. Because when I am in this breathlessness, Aquarius is related to the lungs, in this breath breathlessness, I, I cannot decide what is right or wrong for me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think because there are so many changes that will happen, it's really important to regulate our nervous system, come into our body, become aware of maybe where we act from a state of panic, maybe go into healing with that. Um, 
yeah, ask for support um, by professionals um, to heal these trauma. Um, and it must not be from that lifetime. So mm -hmm. the caries is related to our long-term memory that can um, store memories from past lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there can be so much healing around that, I think, with Pluto and Aquarius. Yeah. 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 I also have heard once, you know, a somatic practitioner saying something along the lines of, you know, the person who gets to win in the room is the person with the strongest nervous system. So, you know, really that goes both ways, right? If you are a calming, grounding presence, you probably are able to absorb the shock of the others, you know, who are in the room with their own agenda, with their own trauma running the show. And similarly, if you are the person who's the most dysregulated, you can also be creating that wave, you know, sending that wave through the room. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point, Verena. I think what I would add to with regards to any sort of transits, but specifically thinking about longer transits such as Pluto and Aquarius is that um, it can be easy for us. And I think this is really a normal, natural response to feel like when we're listening to information about transit, you know, that there's something that we need to do, that we need to somehow fix something. But I think it's really important to, for me at least, to remind myself to continue to just ground myself and to have the experience I'm having currently, you know, to really live in the present moment because, um, you know, thinking ahead or, or really feeling into the energy of the cosmic uh, guidance, I think is powerful and I think it's really important. And also... Um, you know, a reminder to not let that take us away from our current embodied experience, to really live like day by day, hour by hour, right, moment by moment, and to kind of continue to come back to the present moment, because in coming back to the present moment, we are able to maintain, um, I think, a superpower, which is that we can respond from a place of our current truth and a place of truly seeing the situation for what it is or how it appears to us in this moment rather than being run by our past programming by our trauma or any other thing you know i mean for people who are pretty sensitive you may also consistently be run by other people's energies and other people's agenda so i think you know this can seem like i don't know i mean maybe this is advice that's good for you know, any transit, not just Pluto and Aquarius, but I think to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying about nervous system uh, cultivating uh, a deeper relationship with one's nervous system, I think part of that is also continuing to come back to the present moment and allowing your own senses as they currently are perceiving information to be guiding the show rather than your own mental narratives because mm -hmm. um you know that's what we've been taught all our lives to to run the script from our mental uh process thank you yeah. so much jonathan to ground what i was just very spontaneously adding and putting on the table i love that because, mm -hmm. because i mean that what you just said is ex exactly what for me feels like nervous system regulation mm -hmm. to really yeah. come into the moment and feel what is there and give yourself time to I think what what my what my um intent with that or why I said that is that I think that we that it might be important to not forget to have self-compassion mm -hmm. with our human being, with our animal body, even though we may be on a spiritual or on a conscious level, um, can go these next steps and are curators and curious 
but that we really, um, that it might be important to, as you said, come back in the moment and take your body with you mm. in all of these um, developments because for our body, and I, it's, it's interesting, I talked uh, about that with my physio physiotherapist um, because I had some back issues and I went to him and he said that, and, and, and we talked about that, the human system, so really our nervous system and our human body, is actually not used to all of these um, information that are coming in constantly. I mean, we have the internet and all of this media since the 1980s or so, and our human body is, um, is um, yeah, it's not made for that. So yeah. evolution happens over such a long, long time. So the, the evolution of the, our bi biological evolution happens over thousands of thousands of years. And our animal body is not yet attuned to all of that. So it's mm -hmm. very natural that many of us feel overwhelmed. And I think that Absolutely. is something that we should not forget. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Thank you, Verena. Thank you, Jonathan. How do you feel? I feel that we covered the topic very well. Yeah, I think so too. I think there's, a, there's lots of juicy stuff for people to contemplate here. Mm -hmm. And it was no, so nice to flow very free, freely with you um, through the cosmos. As and... always. <laughs> And I would love, um, maybe you want to share what are your, how people can find you, can connect with you, and what are your current offerings. So I'm sure. not sure when we will, um, both of us will um, put it out, but I think somewhere in winter, 2022, mm -hmm. 2023. So, yeah. 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 Thanks for that. Um I would say nowadays my most favorite way of showing up is through my podcast. Um, it's called Healing the Spirit. Maybe you're listening to this at the moment. Um, I do weekly contemplations. So at the beginning of the week, either on Monday or Tuesday, I share a little bit about the energy of the week and um, yeah, any points for contemplation, any points of inspiration that I would like to share with everyone. Um Folks can book a reading with me, uh, find me through my website. Uh, currently, it's still uh, www.natchimusic.com. It's actually, um, yeah, it's a remnant of my music project. Um, and maybe that will change soon. I'm not really sure. Uh, folks can also find me on Instagram. If you just type out my name, I think I will pretty much show up. So, yeah, those are all the ways to... Um, to find me and I am also available for readings. So yeah, if anyone is interested in working one-on-one, -on -one, I am really excited to do that. I have um, some plans to do some, you know, either webinars or cultivate some sort of like learning containers. But at this moment, um, I'm still focused on my current year long astrology program that I'm co-facilitating with my collaborator, Britton LaRue, Astrology as Praxis. So I don't think we will open enrollment until maybe like 2024, but um, yeah, feel free to sign up for my newsletter if uh, you would like to stay in touch. Yeah. How about you, Verena? Thank you so much, Jonathan. And I highly recommend everybody um, your podcast, your one-on-one -on -one readings. It's so wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. I love to yeah get a session by you and it's always so expensive and wonderful yeah um, thank you likewise you're a great practitioner <laughs> John, yeah i i am um the best way to stay in contact with me um especially when you um, speak english is actually my newsletter um because my website is still in german so um i definitely will when Pluto moves into Aquarius, Verena will have a new <laughs> website. No, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I plan to do it now, but yeah, time is limited. So 
the best way to stay in contact is my um, um, newsletter. There is a newsletter for in English language and one in German language. So you mm -hmm. can choose whatever you want. And um, you can follow me on Instagram. But because we don't know what will happen with Instagram, get on my newsletter list. Um, I, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram in both languages, German and English. And if you speak German, I have some offerings um, where I teach astrology, my astro basics course for, um, yeah, for um, people who just want to learn astrology and my uh, living astrology intense program. Um, it starts in January. So it depends on when you are watching this. Living Astrology Intense is really my signature program, quote unquote. Um, it's a six month container and we really live astrology. We deepen our knowledge and we start to have a really an astrological practice and to get um, to deepen our relationship with the cosmos. And it's a wonderful program. It's um, a very small group. So with three live classes per month, um lots of additional material so if you love and want to learn and live and love astrology it's perfect um and i have something coming up in english language so i feel called to teach an english my first astro astrology program in english language in 2023 maybe in spring i'm not yet sure but it will um, be around the topics um, transits and how we can um, yeah use transits for healing and discover the highest potential of transits and what I have in my my heart and in my mind is a really a holistic approach that we really um, bring the transits the energy of the transits into our body that we work with creativity mm -hmm. as well so um, there's something brewing inside of me and if you're interested um, I already have a waiting list for that course or you can just sign up for my newsletter and yeah there will be another thing um, for my German audience a very surprising offering um, around Venus but yeah get on my newsletter list and you will know more and yes I do one-on-one -on -one sessions too so I do one-on-one -on -one sessions in English language and in German language um, on the, I would say, on the ground of evolutionary astrology. But yeah, it's an intuitive approach to evolutionary astrology. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Verena. This has been such a delight. Jonathan, it was so much fun. So much fun that Pluto can be fun. But... <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely. i think i never had so much fun with pluto actually yes this is great i love co-channeling um with you you are always a fountain of wisdom so thank oh, you. you are you are such a source of wisdom jonathan thank you so much thank you <laughs> thank you